In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a 36-year-old city councilman and a finance manager from the Cleveland Clinic who became Catholic after years as an agnostic and an anti-Catholic Protestant. We'll discover what prompted him to search for biblical truth and authority and how his search led him into the Catholic faith. Like everyone else in this series, today's guest came home to the church with the help of Catholics Come Home and responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Tom Henderson. Tom, thanks for joining us in our home, and more importantly, welcome home to the Catholic faith. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Tom, I always like to find out where people grew up and a little bit about their family. So tell us about your family background. Sure. I grew up in Wellington, Ohio, which is a relatively small town out in the country, about an hour away from Cleveland. I grew up with my mom and my dad and my sister, Lisa. And what was your faith background growing up, the faith of your mom and dad, and how much of an influence did that have on your young years? I had quite a bit of influence. My mom and dad actually met at church camp when they were teenagers. Oh. <laughs> wow. And so whenever I was born, we attended a four square church, which is a part of the Pentecostal faith. I see. And then when we moved to Wellington, when I was a young child, we ended up not really going to church quite as much because that particular church didn't exist in the new town where we lived. So I ended up going to the Baptist church for a while in middle school with some friends because they had invited me and that was great. I had a chance to learn about that faith. And then during high school, I started attending with some more friends again, a non-denominational free evangelical church. So I kind of have an ecumenical background, if you will. Yeah, boy, I'll say. <laughs> you mentioned at some point in your life, you kind of started drifting away from faith and God to a certain extent. At what age was that and how did the drift start to happen? I think like many people, you know, after I got done with high school, I went off to college and that was kind of the time when that began to happen. What really happened for me was I took a course called World Religions, and that class didn't really cover the same topics I expected it to. <laughs> it covered some ideas that I hadn't really heard before, some negative views on religion, really, mm. that perhaps religion causes war, and perhaps the world would be better off without religion. Wow. And that was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. It really kind of shook my faith, and I think that that, around that time in my young 20s, kind of led me into an era for most of my 20s where I was really kind of detached from, from religion at all. At one point uh, you were so detached that you you said you were a little against Catholic faith and uh, you ended up drifting even further. Tell us about those years. Well sure. I mean there was a time where I would say it would be reasonable for me to to say that I was agnostic at best and perhaps atheist at worst. If you would have asked me if I was a Christian at that time I probably would have told you that I was but it was really just to be socially acceptable at that time. It didn't so it really, wasn't deeply rooted in your heart? No, it wasn't at that time. By that point, my, in my mid-twenties, really, I had kind of drifted away. I was just doing the things that all young people do at that time in their life. I was working, I was hanging out with friends, having a good time, kind of not really acknowledging the need for God in my own life. I thought at that time that I could just take care of myself and that God didn't really have a role for, I didn't have a role in my life at that time. Without having God at the center, what were some of the repercussions of that? Well, one of the things that I've come to understand now, especially with some more perspective, is that it's difficult to kind of make it through the day a lot of times if you don't have God as the center of your life. I found myself to be very stressed. I had a couple of projects at work that really, really wore me down. And I, I know now with more perspective that if I had had God with me at those times in my life, 
that I might have been a more grounded and balanced person. You had mentioned in our previous interview that you were anti-Catholic at one point. What was that all about? Well, I'm not sure if I was so much anti-Catholic per personally, but I know a lot of people in my family weren't very comfortable with the Catholic faith. Coming from some of the faith backgrounds that they had had, they believed different things in the Catholic Church. And there were some beliefs in the Catholic Church that ran against what they thought was proper. So it was an interesting experience for me to kind of to hear both sides of that at various points in my life. How old were you when you got married and was your wife uh, of a certain faith background? Yes, uh, the greatest thing that ever happened was I met uh, my wife, Melissa, and she was a cradle Catholic. She was, she was born into a Catholic family. Uh, her mom was from the Philippines and the Philippines are, many of those people are very devout Catholics, oh, they're devout. just like her yeah, mom. They're fantastic. Yes, and she had a chance to attend Catholic school as a, as a young girl and she went to a Catholic high school. So she had quite a bit of Catholic education, which was very, very different than, than my upbringing, of course. Did you get married in the church? We did, yes, yes. We had, a, we had a full mass and we got married in the church. And at that time, that was really my first exposure to the Catholic faith. We had gone through the pre-Cana program and we met with the priest at our parish and a very smart man, a lawyer, a nurse, very impressive man, very well educated. And he was the first person that kind of gave me some knowledge, actual knowledge about the Catholic faith. So the fact that you got married in the Catholic Church, would you say your faith and your wife's faith was really strong at that point? I wouldn't say that it was strong at that point. We attended Mass from time to time, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, but it was, it was there in the background, I would say, at that point, around the time that we had gotten married. So you were more doing it for the family and all that, but perhaps both of you didn't really have Christ at the center of your life at that point in your life. I would say at that point in our life, that would be a reasonable way to put it. We went to Mass and we enjoyed being around church and, and I enjoyed hearing the Mass and hearing the homilies, but at that point in my life, it was still not center point. And you still had some doubts in your life? At that point, sure, yes. And I think many people I talked to who are my age had, had doubts. They've heard different things from various people across the course of their lives and they hear a lot of different things in the popular media that might cause them to, to question Christianity or religion in general. And there's certainly an attack by the media on the Christian, Christian faith in general and certainly causing a lot of young people to go in a more secular direction. Yes, I think that's definitely true. It can be quite a challenge these days. In fact, sometimes I feel as though it's, it's a challenge for me to be out as a Catholic. Well, at your age too, and you're in that community, which is, uh, uh, we'll see later, is a good thing. I wanted to ask you one more thing. I'm very intrigued with your career and uh, I won't call it a sideline, but another way you serve your community. So tell us about your career and how you serve your community. Well, my main job is as a financial manager at a large health system in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's what I do for work every single day. But my side job, if you will, is being a city councilman for the city wow. of Bay Village where we live. This is something that we got into a few years ago. And it's really a nice opportunity for me to serve the community and try to help people out with their problems, whether they're small or large. Soon we will learn how Tom's faith journey kicked into overdrive. The fact that many found that teaching hard and some turned away, and yet this teaching still exists today in the Catholic Church, that was the final piece for me. I'm in a good place in my life. And I'm energized by new adventures. I've got friends to laugh with. And a good relationship. But even though I'm kind of comfortable, I sometimes wonder, is there something more? Could God in church be what you're looking for? Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. Tom, at this point in your life, you're serving as a city council person, you're uh, working at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a dream job, you and your wife got married in the church, but something happened where you chose to convert to the Catholic faith. Tell us about that. I did. What really happened was our parish had an educational series around Catholicism, and that gave me an opportunity to really just start to learn more intellectually around the information that the Catholic Church teaches. And around that same time, the other thing that happened was I saw the Catholics Come Home commercial, the one I think that you call Epic, yes. which pr conveys a great deal of information about what the Catholic Church has done across its history. 
And one of the key pieces that I heard in that commercial was that the Catholic Church had compiled the Bible. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, we say, Catholic Church brought the Bible to the world. And what was it about that phrase that hits you hard? Well, it's something I'd never really thought about before. Growing up in the Baptist Church and the Pentecostal Church and the Evangelical Church, I had been taught that the Bible was the sole source of authority. And that made sense to me. That was, that was great. But I had never really thought before about where the Bible had come from. You know, did Jesus walk around handing out Bibles? <laughs> and I learned from, the, from that commercial that the, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church had compiled, compiled the Bible in you know, a, a council long ago. And this got me interested in learning more about where the Bible came from fundamentally. So what did you do next on that quest for knowledge that uh, was sparked by that uh, epic commercial? Well, that's when I really started to read a lot of books. And there's so many great authors out there and there's so much information for those people who just want to go out there and learn about it. Right. But one of the things I discovered while trying to go through all of this information was that the need for authority became self-evident mm. to me. I thought about whether or not it was possible that, for example, if I had read something in the Bible and another person, perhaps in my church or my family, had also read something in the Bible and the Holy Spirit might have been trying to talk to both of us, but we had come to different conclusions and we both brought those conclusions to a congregation, how would those people know whether they should follow my interpretation, which I thought was guided by the Holy Spirit, or mm -hmm. this other person, both of whom meant well. And this is what caused me to come to the conclusion that the, the need for genuine authority is, is necessary, it's logical and required. Where did you find that authority? Well, one of the things that I learned that surprised me was that the Bible, the Catholic Bible, has seven more books than the Bible I had had on my shelf. And so the need for authority was very evident to me when I discovered that piece of information. And so then when I started to think about where could authority come from, the thing that I was most impressed by was that the authority in the Catholic Church comes from Jesus himself. Jesus established the church and he put Peter in charge, what we might call today the Pope. And I learned that there's been an unbroken line of popes from Peter to Francis and it was this exact same apostolic succession yes. that today causes the authority and gives the authority to the church. And that gave me a sense of trust. And it's scriptural too, which appealed to you because it says right there in scripture, Peter, you are rock and upon this rock I will build my church. So that authority was there. So you were able as an intellectual, and we can tell you're an intellectual guy, to say, hey, there's faith and reason. They come together. The church has the authority. This sounds good to me. So at that point, is that when you converted? Well, I think there was one more really key step that really drove it home for me. And that came from none other than Jesus himself. When I was reading the Bible, I, I, I read that Jesus had delivered a hard teaching, a hard teaching around the body and the blood of Christ. In John, John In 6, John, right? Yes, yeah. this, is, this was so compelling to me because I had never heard this part of the story before. I had heard a similar story on the night of Christ's passion but I had never heard the part in John before quite so clearly. And it really struck me that this was a hard teaching and that many people turned away. But Jesus didn't stop them when they turned away and, and correct them and say, no, I was only meaning this in a spiritual or metaphorical way. Yeah, it's a, he didn't say it's a symbol. He didn't. And so then when I learned that the Catholic Church has this exact same teaching in the Eucharist still today, that really hit home for me. The fact that many found that teaching hard and some turned away, and yet this teaching still exists today in the Catholic Church, that was the final piece for me. Awesome. So at that point, after looking back at uh, the scriptures, after looking back at authority in the church, uh, you even found out that the Catholic Bible had seven books that were always in there, by the way. I mean, they Jesus, were. as a good Jewish boy, studied the Septuagint scriptures, and they had those books in there. It wasn't until Martin Luther discarded those books that there now became what we now know of as a King James or a Protestant Bible mm -hmm. that, that took those books out. But those were always in there. So mm -hmm. these revelations of history also appealed to you. And at that point, you said, I'm, I'm going to become Catholic. Yes, I did. The historical record really was the, the piece that su suited me from a logical perspective. I knew that there wasn't the Bible as we know it today at the time of Jesus. And then I really thought about the fact that for, for the Holy Spirit to have protected the Bible, 
and, and made sure that Holy Scripture today was accurate, that would have required, if those seven books weren't supposed right. to be in there, that would have really re required me to believe that the Holy Spirit had let the Christians for 1,200 years been led astray, and that didn't make any sense to me. So it was at that point, through logic and reason together, that I really became Catholic. And something happened in your wife's heart as well at the same time. It did. What was great was we had attended the Easter vigil a few years ago. I leaned over to my wife and I said, I want to do that. And I called my mom the next day and I told her the same thing. I was finally very moved at this point. And so the following fall, I started up with the RCIA program at our parish. And that same priest who had done the pre k education with me just a little bit, several years before, was the person who taught the RCIA program. And my wife attended with me the entire time. And it was funny because even though she had gone to Catholic educational programs for most of her entire life, she still said that she learned a lot during the RCA program. She was seeing it with different eyes and hearing it with different ears. Exactly, as an adult. You know, she mentions that she had learned a lot the way that children are taught, but she had never learned a lot in the way that adults are taught. And the RCIA program gave her that opportunity to learn in a deeper, more intellectually stimulating, faithful way. When you came into the church and your wife came home to a strong faith, I could see her mother, the Filipino Catholic, going, yes, my prayers are answered. I can just picture it now. Yes, yes, I think <laughs> that her mom and her whole family are quite happy that we're both home in the Catholic Church. Amen, as are we. Uh, last question, would, what would you say you realize now that you're fully Catholic that you didn't realize when you were away from faith? Well, one of the main things I would say that I've come to realize is that many people that have talked to me over the years have said that they, they might not believe in God or they don't believe in the Christian faith and that they thought it might just not make sense for them. And it wasn't really making sense to me for many years as well. But once I really dug into the details, it made a lot more sense. One of the things that I had discovered when I was younger was that every time I asked another question about faith, I might find from a person who ought to have authority in my church a conflicting answer mm -hmm. to, a, quite, to that same question might, I might have asked around someone else. Every time I tried to learn more, the system cracked a little bit. Whereas once I began to study Catholicism, every single time I learned more, the whole system made more sense. Everything connected. It connected. It clicked. You had a really cool statement you said about a Christian and being, becoming a Catholic. What was that? Well, for me, it would be true that I was never fully Christian until I became Catholic. And I'm not saying that's true for everyone because we know from the Catechism that people who are Protestant are Christians and we should treat them as such. We're, so we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. But for me, I know that I wasn't really fully Christian until I was Catholic. And I know what you mean by that. You're talking about the fullness of faith, the, the seven sacraments and, and scripture and how everything ties together in one unified piece. It all made sense to you. Yes, it all makes sense. Coming up, find out what's new and different in Tom's life today. We've had opportunities at work to learn how to manage stress. And to be honest with you, I think being a Christian Catholic is the best antidote for stress at work. I also want to dialogue with all the young people. Catholics are committed to building a society which is truly tolerant and inclusive. Let us treat others with the same passion and compassion with which we want to be treated. Come and see what good things God is waiting for you at CatholicsComeHome.com. Tom, how has becoming Catholic helped your life and where do you serve now? Well, I would say it's helped my life right at home. My wife and I both continue to learn more about the Christian faith and Catholicism. And that's something that we really enjoy doing together. It's a way that we like to spend our time. So it's helped your marriage to grow stronger. It absolutely has. We feel very grounded, very calm, very relaxed and centered, I would say is the right word for it. What other ministries are you involved in? Well, I was invited by my parish to become a lector. And so this is a great opportunity for me to share God's word directly with our parish. And one of the most exciting things that I had the opportunity to do was 
participate in the Easter Vigil. I got to read during the Easter Vigil, which was very exciting for me. It's an honor. Because only one year before that, I was watching from the outside, but now it was on the inside participating. That's fantastic. You're also involved in some youth ministries with your wife. What are those two ministries? Well, we get together in a small Christian community with a couple of other young couples in their 20s and 30s. We get together at our house and the other people's houses. We read the upcoming scriptures for the following week, and then we talk about what they mean to us and how we can apply them in our daily lives. It's also just a really nice chance for us to meet other people in the community, meet their children. It's a fun time. That's fantastic. You're also involved in something near and dear to my heart, something called Theology on Tap. Yes, I've attended Theology on Tap a couple of times, and it's a really nice way for the church to reach out to young people. We've had a chance to learn about Catholic art, We've had a chance to learn about ways to help the community. And these are things that young people are very interested in. You know, I know from work that many young people are interested in careers where the company has a mission that aligns with their values. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great thing for the church to reach out and touch people, young people especially, in ways that align with their values, helping the community, advancing social causes. These are things that matter to young people. And Theology on Tap actually reaches out in that way to young people. And it does it in a way, for those viewers who may not know about it, where you invite people to a pub. You may have uh, you know, a, a beer or a glass of wine. And you hear a Catholic speaker. I've spoken at numerous Theologies on Tap, uh, one in Sydney, Australia, Manhattan, a couple of other places here in Atlanta. And I owe a debt of gratitude to Theology on Tap because I met a young man that I liked so much. I introduced him to our daughter, Kimberly. They got married and any day now they're going to have a little granddaughter for us. So I love Theology on Tap. <laughs> That's a great story. Other good fruit has come since you've come back. Well, one of my very, very good friends had a tragic event happen in his life. He, he lost the love of his life and that's something that I can't even imagine what that would be like to go through. We sat down one night and we had a drink and we talked about how that was affecting him and his faith. And I can completely understand how that experience would, would challenge your faith. Sure. But we've had conversations since then and I've always tried to be there for him whenever I can and, and offer him my faith as an example. And he's mentioned once or twice recently that he's been going back to church, uh, he's been meeting with the priest, and I'm very, very happy to hear that. I praise God that you're now evangelizing and you're sharing faith with family and friends as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if any of them have come back yet, but you're planting those seeds which are so important, a part of the new evangelization. Right, from time to time I've invited my mom and my dad and my aunts to attend mass with us. And one of the things that my dad has found very exciting is the depth and richness of the Catholic faith. He enjoys looking at the beautiful churches. He enjoys the wonderful choirs. I'd like to take him to a Latin mass sometime just to show sure. him that level of diversity in the faith. And we'll see what happens in the future on that, but it's great to share the faith with them. That's awesome. Uh, so much of our art, so many of the things we have as sacramentals are all prayers to God, whether incense rising to heaven, stained glass windows that tell a story about our church history, all beautiful ways to share the faith in a Catholic church. How has becoming fully Catholic helped you in your career? Well, much like the rest of my life, it keeps me centered. It keeps me from getting too worried about things. We've had opportunities at work to learn how to manage stress. And to be honest with you, I think being a Christian Catholic is the best antidote for stress at work because I just feel comfortable all the time. Praise God. Tom, we're so glad that your wife has come home to the church, that you have become a part of the Catholic faith, that you together as a couple are sharing this faith with others and it's bearing much good fruit. Welcome home and God bless you and your family. Thank you very much. Want to become a better evangelist? The best place to start is in your own home. At Catholics Come Home, we are often asked what can be done to help keep others from drifting away from the faith in the first place. By becoming a stronger spiritual leader for your family and within your parish community, you can be more equipped to evangelize those you love and help lead and love others toward heaven. I'll never forget a woman I met during one of my travels to speak to a group of Catholics about evangelization. I remember her reaching into her stylish handbag to take out a picture of her large family, which depicted many children and grandchildren. She had a twinkle in her eye as she spoke about her son's ordination to the priesthood and what a treasure it was for many of his siblings to be there to witness it in Rome. 
I asked her if all of her children were practicing Catholics, and with a deep sense of gratitude and humility, she nodded yes. Praise God, I said to her, what's your secret? Oh, I placed them all in God's hands a long time ago, she told me. Every child, everything, in God's hands. We would be fooling ourselves if we thought that we could become strong spiritual leaders of our families or great evangelists in our communities, leading our families and others we meet to heaven, without doing the most fundamental, the simplest, and yet the most important thing, to place everything, our marriages, our children, our spiritual lives, our spiritual leadership, and our evangelization efforts entirely into God's hands. This remarkable woman I met years ago did not just passively do this, however. It's not as if she just said, okay, God, go and make me, my family, and those I witness to holy, and then sat back and let life unravel. She was an active, intentional participant in God's plan for her life and those of her loved ones. She placed her leadership and the work of evangelization in and outside the home in God's hands, effectively saying, okay, now you lead me in this effort. You guide me so that I can, in turn, guide and lead my family and others toward you. Despite our best efforts and prayers though, loved ones may freely stray. But if we entrust our families to the sacred heart of Jesus and to Mary's immaculate heart, and then persevere on the path that the Lord is leading us on, there is no goal too lofty for us. It's the surest path to sainthood, both for us and for those whom God has entrusted to our care. For more practical strategies and inspiring stories to help you become a stronger spiritual leader and a better evangelist to those in your own home and within your community, I invite you to visit catholicscomehome.org and pick up a copy of my book, Head and Heart, Becoming Spiritual Leaders for Your Family. Here's your chance to get active in the new evangelization. Visit the CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can order a Catholics Come Home book, evangelization cards, a DVD of the Evangemercials, or a car magnet. If you or someone you know has come home to the church thanks in part to Catholics Come Home, let us know. Or if you have a comment, question, or want to support our mission, email us at info at catholicscomehome.org or write to us at Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia, 30077. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Once agnostic, this former anti-Catholic Protestant began an intellectual quest for truth. Once Tom discovered that the Catholic Church brought the Bible to the world, he began his research to learn more. Both truth and authority helped seal his conversion to the Catholic faith. Now, Tom and his wife are active in their young adult community in Cleveland. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Tom, Melissa, and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization by helping to love somebody to heaven. I've got love, somebody to love.